thank you for the introduction. My name's Doug, um, and I'm uh, sort of linked to the church through my mum and dad, Jan and Malcolm. I can't see them. Oh, they're, they're at the back there. I think mum's translating, I think. Um, uh, before I start, can I pray? Uh, can, can we pray? So, um, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for us being here today. Thank you for... Um, uh, thank you for us being in this new place, in this cathedral. Um, thank you for the residents sharing their um, sharing their um, their home with us, allowing us to be able to worship you here, Lord. And as we come together today here in freedom, Lord, we, we remember those who can't come together so easily around the world. And as I speak today, Lord, try and make, uh, please um, sort of guide me as I speak. But more importantly, uh, the message that people hear allowed to be the message that you need them to hear, not necessarily what I say. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Cool. Thank you. Um, as I was preparing for this talk, in fact, I'm going to talk about three things today, is my plan. So if the fire alarm goes off, I'm going to, I'm going to try and give them up front so you have them before we start. The first one I want to say is thank you. Um, this is a thank you from me and my family because I've realised we've been actually coming back to this church for quite a long time now. And actually the support and the prayer that we've had over the years has been... Uh, really amazing and I just want to thank you for that. That's, so the first one is thank you. The second one, which I think is the most important one, is that Jesus loves you. And if you don't know that, it's really important you do. In fact, it's the most important thing you will ever hear, that Jesus loves you. And if you know that Jesus loves you, it's good hearing it again. So that's the second most important message. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. And the third one is Jesus loves you so much that he wants you to be part of his mission and he has a purpose for your life. And again, that's going to be the core of the talk, his purpose for your life. Um, and so those are the three things. Thank you, Jesus loves you, the most important one, and he has a purpose for your life. Good. I've covered it all now, so you can go to sleep if you, if you, if you, if you need to. Good. Um, so, I, as I was preparing for this talk, I realised that this summer is actually 21 years since mum and dad moved to Seavering. I was 22 when that happened, so that's half of my life my parents have lived here. And at that time I was at university, and um, some of you may know I was also in the Territorial Army back in the UK. And on the day of my last exam I received a letter from the government inviting me for a summer holiday to Iraq. It wasn't really an invitation I had to go. So mum and dad had just moved here, and so I thought I'd better come and see them in their new home more to say goodbye than anything else, actually. And I don't remember much about that trip, apart from being shocked how much work there was to do on their mill and what a mistake they probably made. Um, um, but I do remember coming to church. And I, I, we were at Mark and Monique's house in those days, and I do remember being prayed for during that time. And really from that point forward, returning to the Sea Ray, the church has always been a really important part of that in the many forms you've been. And it's wonderful to be here on the first day in, your, in sort of the new location for the church. It has been a constant of my life. You've always been really welcoming to me and as my family has grown to them as well. And I want you to know that your sort of support, prayer, encouragement has played no small part in my life and where it has gone in my own Christian journey. So I just want to thank you for that and encourage you that your, your, you know, your faithfulness has been really important to me. So thank you. So that's the first one. Thank you. Done. We're a third of the way through, I guess. Um, today I'd like to share to you about the work with you about the work that I'm doing. This is my favourite picture of the work that we're doing. It's a picture of a person standing in front of a group of people preaching the gospel and seeing their lives transformed by it. And that's the whole purpose of what I do. We go around supporting churches across Africa, trying to get that situation where you have someone who knows what he's doing or, or she's doing, standing in front of people preaching the gospel. Um, but what I want to do, that I want to talk about a, a story that Jesus told in the Bible. Um, Jesus used to tell his stories in, in things called parables, which were simple stories but with profound lessons. Um, and the one we're going to talk about today is in Matthew's Gospel, which is one of the books of the Bible that talks about Jesus' life. Um, and it's currently known as the parable of the talents, or in some cases, the three servants. So I'm going to ask um, one, of my, one of my children to come up and uh, read that, that, uh, that parable to us. There you go, sweetheart. Hopefully this will work. 
I've got it on the slide as well. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were harsh. You were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I had harvested crops I, and I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why did you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, um, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where they will be weeping and where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you, sweetheart. I, I did mean to actually show this slide when I was talking about my family and saying thank you. This is Olivia here, the first time she came to Seabury, so I just wanted to point that out. Sorry. This parable highlights several important truths about the kingdom of heaven. How do I do that? Sorry. Is that okay? Okay, this, uh, this parable highlights several important things about the kingdom of heaven. The master entrusts his servants with different amounts of money or talents according to their abilities and then goes on a journey Upon his return, he finds two of the servants have been faithful and multiplied what they've been given. But one, the third servant has buried his. He's buried it through fear. The master's response to his faithful servants resonates deeply. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. This is, I don't know about you, but this is the response I want to hear from my father. But this parable isn't just about money. It's about gifts, opportunities, and the responsibilities that God has entrusted to us. If we are called, we, we are called to be faithful stewards, whether our task seems small or large, and to use what we've been given for the growth of God's kingdom. This means taking risks in our faith investing in others, and not letting fear hold us back from fulfilling the purposes God has for us. With this parable in mind, I want to talk about what I do. Um, with this... Can I just catch up? Sorry. Um, uh, you said she's going to be done. If I could play music, I'd sing, but I won't.
I don't even have any jokes either, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I think French is a prettier language, so it explains things in a better way, I think, I suppose. Um, uh, um, yeah, so I'm going to share about what we do um, at the Relay Trust. And our, um, our mission is to really support Anglican churches across Africa. What we want to support them with is theological training. There's a great, um, there's a great explosion of Christians across Africa. People are being born as Christians, but there's also the spread of the gospel is, is happening at an unbelievable rate. But what, you're, what you find in many places, the level of teaching and understanding of the Bible, the discipleship, is very poor. And so what we as an organisation try to do is work with Anglican churches across Africa to, um, to help them with their training of their people. But it's not just about imparting knowledge to people. It's about equipping local leaders to serve their communities with both wisdom and grace, multiplying their impact just as the faithful servants in the parable did. Africa is an incredibly diverse continent. People talk about Africa as if it's one place. It's as different as anywhere else. And the needs of each region vary very greatly. As a trust, we focus on working with the Anglican Communion, largely because of the structure of their churches in their sort of Episcopal makeup. So they have, we can go in at the top of the church in order to affect the grassroots. Um, and that's how, we, that's how we tend to work. We not only work, um, but we also work in the poorest places in the world. That takes us to Africa. And the way we work out the poorest places in the world is using this, this matrix I have on the screen. It's used, uh, using something developed at Oxford University in the UK uh, called the Poverty and Human Development Index. And essentially we look at the health, the education levels and the living standards of countries. Not war, not things like that, because these go down if, those, if you have war and famine and things like this. So those are the standards that we look at. And then if we take those standards and we put them over the world, we overlay that. The darker colours on the screen are the poorer countries in terms of that matrix. And so you'll see the majority of the poorest countries in the world are in Africa, hence our focus. The countries of the Sahel in particular, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, all Francophone countries are the poorest, along with South Sudan, which I'll talk about in a moment. We then overlay, because, of, because we do, we overlay the Anglican Communion on top of it, um, and we work in the poorest diocese in that communion. Um, we currently work in eight of the provinces, you'll see there's seven on there, uh, that's because the yellow one, North Africa, is in fact the province of Alexandria and the province of um, Sudan, which is currently you know, in a horrible civil war. You will notice that places like Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger are not on the list. It's because there aren't any Anglican churches there. We don't work there. But I'm hoping that will change. So what I'd like to talk about first, I'm going to talk about three areas rather than cover everywhere. The first area I'm going to talk about is West Africa. So I'm going to try and do this at the pace of the video. We'll see if it works. West Africa is the most populous part of the continent and has a long history of interaction with the, both uh, Europe and North America. Although not always in a great way, um, if you consider colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade, which still resonates within those countries. The Anglican Church there has been present uh, since the eight, early 1800s and is probably the oldest Anglican churches in, in, in Africa. But the churches face enormous challenges. West Africa is painfully poor. And Islam is the dominant religion in many areas, of, of often manifesting itself in an extremely strict and resistant form due to anti-colonialist sentiments. Additionally, occult practices rooted in African traditional religions and secret societies permeate the, the communities there, placing spiritual warfare right at the centre of the church's battle. Our work in West Africa involves partnering with Anglican churches across the region Although we don't work in Ghana and Nigeria, quite frankly they're too rich for us. 
with the Anglican Church, uh, even by African, although it's all by African standards, it still only counts for 1% of the population. So in my opinion, a growth area. One significant challenge is the clergy are trained to remember things, not, fully, not necessarily fully understand and be able to implement them. Recognising this, the leaders of those churches have asked us to support them with practical ministry training. And so we've been focused on equipping leaders across that province and establishing practical ministry and established a practical ministry training centre. I think some of which the pictures have come up on the screen. And we believe it's already making a big impact. Looking forward, our next focus in this region is language training. The areas we work in are English speaking predominantly, less Guinea and Guinea-Bissau. The areas that we, the church wants to move in are French speaking. And so they're setting up French language, want to set up a French language school in Guinea for people primarily to come from Liberia to learn French. Um, and there have been exciting developments. The church has recently been planted, you were pleased to know, in Côte d'Ivoire, although I've not marked it on the map, it's the red one next to Liberia. So a church has just been planted in Côte d'Ivoire in the last couple of months. It is actually a native language church, as in an indigenous language church, as opposed to a French language church, which has helped because the people in Liberia speak the same local language as they do in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. And also Guinea-Bissau, where a church has been planted by the Anglican Church of Brazil. The Archbishop, who is based in Guinea, also has plans to send missionaries to both Mali and Burkina Faso in the coming years. Another exciting development is a partnership between the Diocese of Cameroon, which is largely urban-based, and, and the missionary area of Chad, whose churches are predominantly rural. And they're, share, they're sharing their experiences to help each other develop their churches. You could share, say they're sharing their talents to support each other in the growth of the kingdom. The second area I'm going to talk about is South Sudan. Um, South Sudan is the world's newest country. It's already had a really troubled history. Um, it's got a population of around 11 million. Around half of those identify as Anglicans. However, the church faces enormous challenges from, um, from huge numbers of their, their members being nominal Christians, not really believing in Jesus, and a loss of members to more vibrant Pentecostal churches, including a prosperity gospel, which is very damaging, and also the influences of Western society, which, are very, which conflict massively with traditional teachings. In response to these challenges, we've supported the church with the development of a thing called the Anglican Discipleship Program, which is lay leader training initiative. Over the past 18 months, facilitators, and, and these are the training sessions that you're seeing on the screen, facilitators have been training congregational leaders across the country, empowering them to give life-changing teaching on a weekly basis. Our vision is that every believer should have, be able to receive sound, life-changing teaching from a trained leader every week. To meet the church needs in South Sudan, we, we want to be able to train one leader, congregational leader, for every hundred people in the church. With around 4.4 million Anglicans, that's a lot of leaders, and it means we need to train 44,000 to meet today's needs. As the population grows, we hope, and we hope the church will continue to evangelise, our goal is to support the training of 60,000 leaders over the next 25 years in that country. This is our largest project by quite a long way. And it's incredible, it's, I think it's a really incredible example of how God is multiplying our talents. South Sudan is the most challenging, I, I wrote in my notes perhaps, but it is the most challenging country in Africa to work in, I, I have found. There are no roads half the year, and there is constant armed conflict going on in many places. We often see, why is this training not taking place? And they say, well, there's been fighting in our village. No, that's why we didn't, that's why we didn't need to do the training. Really challenging environment. Um, yes, in 12 months, God has taken some ideas on a slide and rolled this program out across the entire country. Today, or this week, 6,000 people are under training in South Sudan. And that has been going on for at least a year, 6,000 every week. This is a remarkable testament to the Holy Spirit's power in multiplying the small talents we have to offer.
The final place I'm going to talk about, because I've probably gone over time, is Angola. Angola is a Portuguese-speaking country in southern Africa with a troubled past and continues to be affected by the legacy of conflict. Um, its state is a very communist outlook, which means the church has been severely controlled throughout its history, although nominally 99% of the population are Christians. The Anglican Church is the newest, or the Anglican Church in uh, Angola is the newest province of the Anglican Communion, along with its partner church in, in Mozambique. In Angola, there are four dioceses. The first, half, the first three dioceses are in the north of the country. The other, the other diocese in the south of the country. That diocese is about the size of France. Um, Angola is fast, and it's, the roads are bad, and it's landmined everywhere. It takes five days to drive from one side to the other. In the diocese of the central and the south, this diocese is the size of France, we've been trying to support their evangelism efforts. And we, so we've been working with a secular charity called the Halo Trust, which many of you may have heard of. The Halo Trust um, um, removes landmines from the ground. And so together the church is working with the Halo Trust to identify where landmines are. And then the Halo Trust removes them and the Halo Trust is supporting the church in moving into those areas. This partnership between them is literally allowing the gospel to go to places that couldn't be reached because of landmines. And our aspiration is to implement a program very similar to the one in South Sudan. So as landmines are removed, trained people can come in and lead churches in those areas. It's really, really exciting. But the final thing I'd like to share about Angola is um, I went to a church in Ouija, which is right in the north, and probably the strongest church there. Um, church services in Africa last a long time. Traditionally, or typically, I would say you plan on about three to four hours if you're lucky. Um, I, attended the, but I attended this service in Ouija in northern Angola, and we got to the end of the sermon, and we were only 50 minutes in. And I thought, crikey, I could get in and out in an hour and a half on this service. And it was amazing, because there was over a thousand people in the church, and I thought, this is very strange. And then the priest in charge came forward and called for the collection. For the next hour and a half, I sat and watched people bringing their offerings to the, to, to the altar. People were dancing, people were singing, and every vegetable you've ever seen under the planet, cassavas, um, bananas, yams, everything was brought there. There were people in the church team whose job was to remove the food so more could be brought. I have, will never, ever forget the ex that experience, the, the noise of people singing and dancing and praising God, joyfully giving. And I think, um, and they use this food, and they take, they give some to the poor of the of the, uh, of the church. They give some to the clergy; it's part of the clergy's salaries. But then they sell the rest in the local market to help re re reintegrate, you know, to bring funds into the church. For me, this is the most beautiful example I've seen people using their gifts and talents for the kingdom, joyfully offering what they have to support the work of the church and those in need. So, each region I've mentioned, West Africa, South Sudan and Angola, face unique challenges. Yet the essence of the work remains the same. Faithfully multiply the talents God has given us and use them to know his glory. We're dedicated to this mission and supporting local churches as they strive to grow and flourish, no matter what obstacles they're facing. However, this call for faithfulness is for each of us, not just for people in full-time ministry. Whether you're here in France, or in Africa, or anywhere else God has chosen to place you, we have been given talents. Our own time, our resources, and our gifts. It doesn't matter how long you've been a follower of Jesus, or what stage of life you're in, or how underqualified you might feel. God has entrusted you with something. It could be the resources you have to share, skills to offer, comfort to provide, conflicts to stop, or even something as simple as washing a dish or serving someone. The question we must ask ourselves is how are we going to use these talents? Will we bury them out of fear of what might happen? Or are we going to step out in faith, trusting that God is going to multiply our efforts? One of the most remarkable aspects of being entrusted to use our talents, I think, 
is to further the kingdom um, in the same way that Jesus has. And our job, as well as his, is to not only expand the kingdom on this earth, but to, you know, to, but to guide people to him, to the lost to him, to be reconciled with God. I mentioned this at the beginning, but this is the most important part of my talk. Okay, so if you haven't heard anything, please listen to this part. <coughs> God created us in his image, and he desires us to be in relationship with him. However, our sin has separated us from God. Jesus, God's son, came to earth as a human and died on the cross as the only payment for that sin. And he rose again from the dead, triumphing both over sin and death. Through his sacrifice, Jesus brought God's kingdom to the earth and he paid for our sin. And if you accept him as your Lord and saviour, you will be saved and reconciled with God. Accept God's forgiveness and you will receive the free gift of eternal life. And you get to grow closer to God every day, which is pretty amazing. Now, many of you will have heard this message millions of times, loads and loads of times. For some of you, this may be the first time you've heard it. For some of you, it may be the last time you'll hear it. And you, it's an invitation to respond. If you didn't know this before and you don't know Jesus, I'm going to give you the chance to give your life to him right now. Okay? And you don't have to do it in an embarrassing way. If there's anything I've said has resonated, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm just going to say a prayer. And if you want to say this prayer with me, say it. And if you don't, you don't have to. I'm going to, if we can close our eyes and let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I fall short of your glory. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I ask you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Saviour. Amen. We just had a, a song and I, I thought, it, I wrote it, scribbled it on the bottom of my phone saying I'm changed it. Your chains are gone, you've been set free. Your God, your Saviour has, has rescued me. Yeah? So that's good. And if you've just done that there, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and say hi, but genuinely, there is partying in heaven if you have just done that. There is a party being thrown in your honour in heaven right now if you've given your life to Jesus. But the only thing I'm going to ask you to do is before you leave this room, tell someone. So that they can guide you to the next people to help you be discipled and learn more about Jesus. Okay, so that's the, that's the thing you've got to do if you prayed that for the first time. Tell someone so that then you can be guided to someone to talk about it. I'm coming in. Jesus didn't walk around knowing he was divine. Instead, we see his humanity through the Gospels. During his temptation after baptism, his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he literally sweated blood through fear, and on the cross. Just like us, his awareness of his vocation and calling was vulnerable to testing, challenge, fear, and doubt. Jesus experienced all the emotions you do. He knows how you feel when you are challenged to use your talents to help further God's kingdom. He knows it is scary. He knows it feels uncertain. As we are saved by Jesus' incredible sacrifice and love for us, we are called out of love to use the gifts he has given to further his kingdom. I challenge you to do that. Thanks very much.